Shlama Lohun, Anna Shimi Ile, Sarah Gahu, Arketa, Bet Erke, Asher Banipa, Gushotasa, Mardutanaya, Aturaya. It is my privilege to participate in the Nebu Circle Lecture Series, which marks the beginning of many more insightful lectures to come. In the annals of ancient Assyria, the god Nebu was the Lord of Wisdom and revered as the patron deity of scribes and scholars instilling within the heart of Assyrian civilization a profound veneration for knowledge and erudition. Under the benevolent gaze of illustrious rulers such as Ashurbanipal, a grand library arose in Nineveh, ele elevating the pursuit of scientific understanding to unprecedented heights. The Assyrian legacy of intellectual inquiry persisted, transcending epics and weaving its way into the fabric of history as the Assyrians founded esteemed centers of learning, exemplified by the illustrious school of Nisibis, which propelled Islamic civilization into a golden age of enlightenment and progress. Enduring trials and tribulations, including the tumultuous First World War, the Assyrian people clung to their unquenchable thirst for knowledge, allowing their love of learning to go undiminished. In the embrace of this noble tradition, the Nebu Circle Lectures, initiated by the Assyrian Cultural Foundation, now serve as a platform for distinguished scholars to congregate to impart their insights into the annals of Assyrian history, literature, language, and culture, preserving and perpetuating the brilliance of a civilization forever marked by its profound love for wisdom. Our speaker for today is Dr. Ephraim Yeldiz, who is a professor at the University of Salamanca, teaching philology, Hebrew, and Aramaic studies. Dr. Yeldiz's topic for today's lecture is, how should modern Assyrian be taught? Oh, and everyone, please, by the way, turn on your cameras. That would be great. Our lecturer for today, Dr. Yeldiz studied in several countries, including Germany, Italy, France, and Israel, obtaining a bachelor's degree in philosophy, two degrees in ecclesiastical and biblical studies, and a doctorate in biblical theology. He is skilled in classical languages such as Greek and Latin and Semitic languages such as Hebrew and Aramaic. He also knows modern languages, including Spanish, English, French, German, Italian, modern Assyrian Aramaic, and Turkish. He is a full professor at the Faculty of Philology, specializing in Aramaic history, language, and literature. He has taught biblical and rabbinic literature, Old Testament institutions, and biblical Aramaic. He has participated in many national and international congresses and has given seminars and courses in his speciality in different countries, such as Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, and the United States. He has also participated in teaching staff mobility programs at the University of Cambridge and the University of Bucharest. After the lecture, we invite you to stay updated on the latest news and events of the Assyrian Cultural Foundation by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. These lectures will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. I will provide you with the links to all our social media channels in the chat. I kindly request that you keep your microphones muted throughout the lecture to prevent any interruptions. Please note that failure to comply may result in being removed from the Zoom session. Now, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Robert DeColetta, who has helped me organize these lectures. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. And welcome, everyone, to the Nabu series of lectures. I just want to say we have these lectures periodically. We're going to put at least one lecture per month. And we're very honored today to have Dr. Ephraim Yaldiz talk about how Assyrian should be taught, modern Assyrian. And he's going to go over the history of the language and the important institutions that uphold this language. And um, in addition to these lectures, we have something called the Assyrian Circle, where we will be speaking in the Assyrian language only. And our focus there in that series of lectures, which will be going on again once a month. So there will be two lectures per month through the Assyrian Cultural Foundation and the Ashurbanipal Library. 
One will be the Assyrian Circle, and one will be the Nabu Circle Lectures. Nabu Circle Lectures are devoted to academics and will be given in English. The Assyrian Circle Lectures will be given in Assyrian, typically by an author of an Assyrian book on a, on a variety of subjects, or the son or daughter of a person who wrote a book and they will be sharing their experience in the Assyrian language. And it's meant to generate interest in the Assyrian language and generate interest in writing in Assyrian, Lishana Suraya or Aturaya. So with that, uh, we are very honored and I will uh, give the floor to Dr. Afram Yaldis, please. Um, so after this a few words, I'm I'm honored and I'm thankful to you for giving me this occasion to talk about a topic which is very important uh, for today's uh, Assyrian society around the world, how the Assyrian language should be taught. Uh, do you hear me well? Good. Uh, before talking about the main topic, I would love to, as highlighted by, by Robert, I would like to make a kind of resume upon the historical development of the so-called Aramaic language and why it's called Aramaic and not uh, in other way and so on. <clears throat> well, uh, as you know, this... Um, the so-called Semitic languages uh, that were structured, especially from, from the 19th century onward, they are three clearly defined uh, linguistic family trees, uh, which are called uh, Northeastern language or, uh, or family of language, which is Akkadian and then Assyrian and Babylonian. And uh, there is the second one, which is Northwest, uh, which is uh, called, uh, which is divided into two important branches, which is Aramaic and Canaanite, from which then uh, there's an evolution, which from which uh, have been originated Hebrew, Phoenician, Moabite, and Edomite, and so on. And there is a third Semitic uh, linguistic family, which is. Uh, Southwest, which is Arabic and Ethiopian language. So this is just as, as, a, as a short um, division, which is much more complex if we, we, get, we get deeper in it. Now, uh, as, you, as you see, there are two languages that are directly linked to the Assyrian society or to the Assyrian history from the beginning of, let's say, uh, of the uh, eighth uh, century, but especially uh, even I would dare to say in the ninth century, when the Assyrian Empire started getting larger, and uh, after the op occupation of the current Syria, many uh, Assyrian small states came under the Assyrian control, and what happened? Uh, at that time, there were clearly several Aram, uh, Aramaic dialects. There was not a common uh, mean of communication between the different uh, um, states. But after the deportation uh, of several uh, our, uh, people from the Aramean origin from Syria and from the south, I mean, from even from the border of Lebanon until the southeast they, uh, of Turkey, there were several people um, taken from their uh, original homeland to several Assyrian uh, cities, and Ashurwa was one of them. And many other peoples were moved then to Syria, uh, from Israel to Ashur to Babel, and so on. So there were there was a kind of a strategy where the people were really uh, getting in touch with each other, and uh, the Aramaic language for the first time 
when I'm, I'm using these terms because uh, they are usually used by the scholars, the imperial Aramaic, like, where does it come from? Uh, who gave this name uh, to such a period? Because when, when the Western world um, became acquainted with, with, the, with the Eastern world, Mesopotamia and Middle East, many new uh, languages that somehow were buried, buried or died, as we are used to say, were rediscovered. So they created a structure in order to, to divide these languages according to their um, links to different uh, linguistic families. And Aramaic language as imperial mean was started clearly and today we have uh, more than enough sources that show that those who really invented this new, this second, let's say, language, uh, which has then become gradually a, a, an international uh, communicate means of communication between the Assyrian imperial society was invented, was created by the Assyrians themselves. So uh, the simple fact that we, we call it uh, Aramaic is only a question of how this language is connected to the ancient dialects, the structure, the verb system, the morphology, so on. But I would dare to say that this language could be also called Assyrian Imperial Aramaic. It was because it was really created at that period. Uh, we see that from this policy of, the, of uh, deportation, we have two centuries where we see that the uh, people from, from this region uh, or from the Arame, uh, Aramean origin were integrated totally in the Assyrian society. Those Arameans that were taken from Kwe, Patina, uh, Hamath, uh, Damasia, uh, Geshur, and so on, were after 200 years totally assimilated and they uh, used the Assyrian, let's say, uh, cultural practices, liturgies, and so on. They thought as Assyrians, they were totally integrated in the Assyrian uh, society strata. They were employed by the Assyrian administrative system as well. So uh, today saying that because there's an Aram uh, Aramaic language, there's an Aramean origin is totally wrong. I would say that this uh, imperial Aramaic, which is called in this way, I would, I would say it's an imperial Assyrian Aramaic. And we will see how close how this, this, this links are between the Assyrian imperial language and then the second Assyrian imperial language, which is uh, Aramaic. Uh, Sargon II was totally bilingual. And he was, he, he, he he, he sometimes complains why uh, a letter was written in, in not in the official language, because at that period, we see that several technical words are sent to those communities that are under the Assyrian uh, control or power or administra adm administrative system. Uh, they start writing in, in, in somehow in Aramaic. Why in Aramaic? I, this is my uh, personal opinion. I think it's, it's a question of being practical. If you compare the Assyrian uh, language, which uh, is written with the cuneiform script that needs at least 610, 613 uh, syllabs in order to write correctly, in comparison with 22 letters, everybody would try to change to a system that then has given the occasion to develop this language in a place where, which is not its original place where it, it uh, became uh, a reality as a language. So let's, let's just uh, see that the Aramaic language 
was the second language of the Assyrian society at the beginning, and then it, have, it has become then when the Persians, under the Khurish, uh, the uh, king Cyrus, uh, Elamites, Meds, Babylonians, and so on, when they um, won the war against the Assyrians, they kept two important things, administrative system and the language, because it was still well settled. So there was no need to shift to another language. This was, in my opinion, one of, of the main reasons why the imperial army, the so-called imperial army, was kept even during the Persian or the Achaemenid uh, period. What influences does uh, have uh, the Aramaic language from the Assyrian, we know today they are, there is a huge amount of words that were taken from the Assyrian language, because when the Aramaic language became the option to become uh, an imperial language, there were many technical words that were taken as loan words from the imperial language itself. This is, for example, we see not hundreds, they are even probably thousands of words that date back to the uh, Assyrian origin. The Aramaic language in its beginning, we do, we do have only two uh, tenses, zawna da'bar, zawna da'atid, accomplished and yet not accomplished action. The presence, for example, zawna ta'im is clearly taken from the Assyrian language. So, uh, this connection between the two languages is in a natural process of a society that lives uh, together, a society that looks also for the simplification of the communication mean in this case. So this is, in my opinion, one of the main reasons why uh, the language, the, Assyri the Aramaic language, for which for me is an Assyrian Imperial Aramaic, became the second language after 200 years of living together. But then during the period when the Greeks came and invaded the whole Middle East, there we see um, a clear intention of the Greeks to transmit also their language and their culture. And this has given a new uh, situation. In the fourth century BC, they started creating ISILs. For example, in Antioch, Greek was uh, really um, strong. But from Antioch to, uh, to Orhai, to Edessa, there is not a big uh, distance the Aramaic or the Assyrian Aramaic were clearly uh, the main language in that region. So we have, in order to talk about these different languages, when we say um, East and West uh, Aramaic languages, and, uh, and so on, these classifications are really just in order to, to somehow uh, update the reader about where these languages were developed. When we talk about, about uh, then the periods, we do have an ancient Aramaic, we do have an imperial, I would say Assyrian Aramaic, and then we have a middle period where this kind of uh, separations took place and that have given also to a new era where this Imperial army was then developed in different places, in isolated places. This is why we talk about the Palmyrene Aramaic, the Mandin Aramaic, then, then afterwards Nabatine, uh, Syriac, Surat, uh, and so on, because the Greek was competing with the Aramaic. This separation endured, or this, this process of uh, having two main languages in the Middle East endured until the arrival of the Arabs. Was the Arabic, the situation uh, changed totally. Uh, we know that until the 14th century, the biggest uh, literary production of our language, uh, which we call this uh, classical Syriac, starts from the third until the 14th century. 
where we have also this kind of, again, um, borrowing and buying, uh, uh, giving and receiving, because the language or languages are a mean which shows how a society or the different societies get in touch with each other. And then the borrowing processes, the so-called loan words from the Arabic and from uh, the, the Surat or the Aramaic are a natural process. Let's now just in order to tell you, uh, calling these languages this and that is somehow a, a scholar issue that has been a scholar issue at the beginning in order to classify, to structure the languages. But somehow when we come to this period, there's a huge confusion. Uh, the people who, ha who be have become acquainted with the Middle East, with Mesopotamia especially, uh, were based, their knowledge was based on the biblical texts and also on the ecclesiastical history. Why we uh, why we speak about Syriac, Syrian, and so on in in the uh, in the uh, modern languages? Because when they started uh, rediscovering the Middle East, there was a structure still given by the by the religious uh, part, which was called the so-called. Syriac or Syrian churches today. The Church of the East is called the Eastern uh, Syrian Church. Due to this information that was transferred to, to, to the Western world. And the scholars at the beginning were mm, dependent in somehow on what was transmitted until then. When the archaeology discovered many other languages, then the structure beca became or has become a bit more complex. Then, but several parts have not had the chance to, to develop as, in my opinion, they deserve, especially the modern part. Today we call the modern Assyrian language Syriac or Neo Aramaic and so on. But it's again a kind of denomination that has been given from the from outside. We were a bit, in my opinion, we were a bit lazy in this in this uh, field. And thanks to the to the Western scholars, we have learned much more about our uh, legacy as a whole, uh, cultural, historical, uh, linguistic legacy. But at the same time. We, we, we haven't learned to defend our language, our linguistic heritage or legacy as it deserves. We, depend, we still depend on these uh, um, denominations where in my opinion, is, uh, justice is, hasn't achieved uh, the real point where we should uh, be today. I don't know why uh, the Assyrian, modern Assyrian language can't be called as it is, even among the, the scholars. We call it, uh, we divide it first of all in uh, two branches, Western and Eastern, perfect. We know the historical reasons. But then uh, calling it Neo-Aramaic or Turoyo or uh, this and that, in my opinion, doesn't reflect the, the historical uh, true reality of this people. This is why in the last period, I insist very much on two terms, which we will cultivate for the next uh, years. Surd Surait. And Surd Surait, both they reflect two important issues. Surd and Surait are Assyrian. Whether West and East, for instance, that's not a question. I'm not going to enter in this point. But as you know, we have today sources that go back to the uh, BC era, where we see that Sur and Ashur are synonymous. No problem of calling my own language Surat. 
which then can be translated into English, German, or whatever language we, we are dealing with as a Syrian. So there are two important points why we haven't been able to show to the, to the international uh, society our linguistic identity as well. In my opinion, it's also a, a point that must be touched, not here, but I'm just mentioning, I'm going to mention it. The point is when we have uh, been converted to Christianity, we have given much more importance to our religious identity than our uh, national one. At that point, as you know, uh, we counted only on three um, small kingdoms, Asra'ayne, Hatra, and Ashur, which were from the Assyrian origins and where Assyrian Aramaic or Aramaic uh, as it is, was spoken between themselves without any problem uh, or in, in a natural way. But when we, we changed uh, uh, from our ancient uh, faith to the new faith, several elements were clearly intentionally avoided in order to focus on the new era. Okay, so this is why uh, we, we have been called with many other names, but not with the real one. We were, were uh, the, the church of the Persian, the Persian church, the Syrian church, this and that church is the fruit of this point where we haven't, we weren't uh, somehow officially recognized as a territory where we could have developed this part, but we depended on our spiritual leaders who have given much more importance to, the, to their face than to their uh, national identity. It's a no normal process. It's not a critic, okay? But just in order to let you know, where does all this confusion come from? And where the, the Western scholars have done a huge effort, but they haven't been able to go to see the whole legacy as a whole, and not just focusing on what would they receive from our uh, religious leaders. Today, we have the chance to, 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 to add this part because whether we want or not, we are Assyrians. Now, uh, I'm going to, to make a jump to, to the modern language that I have been mentioning. We have our own language divided into two main dialects due to the historical uh, discussions and so on. We know about them. But we, I'm, I have a big concern in relation, I'm going to see him. Uh, uh, Robert, please, you tell me when we, uh, I have to stop, okay? Or uh, Sarah. We are, we are facing now a period which is, in my opinion, very important. We are in, in a period where or we decide to cultivate our language, or we will lose any chance of uh, cultivating it, uh, maintaining it, and using it as a mean that has been used for millenniums, not only for centuries. Our language, in my opinion, uh, hasn't had the chance, and it's a miracle that it survived until today. If we, we take in account all the the historical circumstances, uh, persecutions, massacres, and so on. It's a miracle that today we are able to still talk about modern Assyrian army. So, but now there is a huge problem, and this is my, my concern, that the biggest part of Assyrians live uh, abroad, live in, in diaspora, and if we don't have uh, a kind of strategy, a kind of methodology, and a system where our language, our culture, our history is taught as it deserves, then we really are um, 
undergoing a huge danger. Our language is now classified under endangered languages because of the number. So where should we focus on? What should we do in order to keep our um, beloved language alive and also to develop it? Before giving an answer to this question, I would like to focus on where the language was uh, cultivated at the beginning. And we have to distinguish two important issues. One thing is the learning, the systematic learning of the language according to a grammar book and this and that. And other issue is to transmit it in a natural way starting from the main point, which is the family. If we go back a bit uh, in past tense, we see clearly that uh, due to the circumstances that I have mentioned, massacres, persecutions, and no chance of creating a center where we could develop this language. Due to these facts, the church was one of the places where the language was cultivated. But somehow the church focused on, on the Syriac, on the classical part, and didn't give importance to the modern one. And thanks to the, to the daily life, and thanks to somehow isolated uh, villages and somehow small cities, that have a cultivated language, today we can have the chance to say that our language is still alive. One of this, as, as I told you, this is why we have to, to distinguish the three main, uh, let's say, parts, religious centers, family, and educational center. Today must focus in, a, in an intelligent and practical way to transmit the language. Why I'm talking in this way, I have been uh, in the last, uh, at least last 20 years, focusing on this uh, project in order to find a way, the way to transmit our language in an effective way. As I told you, in the religious, um, let's say in the churches, in the parishes, in the diocese, and so on, there is a small effort but which should be reinforced because much more importance is given to the classical part. Now we see, uh, especially in diaspora, uh, in Australia, I was, I don't know how, how I was amazed about seeing small kids learning our language at school in a natural way. This is what we have to focus on. So we have to, to sum these forces in order to teach our language as it serves. In the, in, the, in the church, it's clearly, I mean, also the priests should learn better their language. And this not, I hope, not offending any of our priests or bishops, but honestly, they should learn the language in order to transmit it well. Family. Family, in my opinion, is the core of this project. If we don't start seeing they come to the world, our kids, when they are 15, 16, 20 years old, it's a bit late, in my opinion, because they don't grow up in a natural way with the language. I'm telling you things that I have been applying to myself. There is no Assyrian uh, community in Salamanca at all. But my kids, they speak Assyrian in a natural way, but even between themselves. So just we have to find the way how to do it in the family. Especially for those who live in diaspora. And he, here I, I realized long time ago, a complex that Assyrian have, we have immigrated or what we were focusing on that our kid, kids speak perfect English, French, German where, where they live. And then we would say, yeah, uh, our surat will come afterwards, or surat will come. No, this is a totally wrong way of transmitting your heritage. And this, this complex 
has created this kind of shifting uh, to the main language. I mean, I'm conscious uh, of a fact that the language, uh, the main language is the, the one you are living daily with. If you are in Spain, uh, whether you want or not, you go to the school and you learn Spanish, but you have to teach at home, not only teach, to live the language at home. What I did, especially, and this was my, my main concern, how to transmit to my kids my mother tongue in a natural way. Indeed, I introduced a third language at home in order to create these two linguistic registers. Their main language, Spanish, and their second main language is Assyrian. Why? Because when I'm with them, my wife is not Assyrian. I mean, she's now Assyrian, but she's not from the Assyrian origin. But we created this system where our kids talk in a natural way between themselves. And this is the point. In Assyrian, not in Spanish. Why? Because from, from the beginning, we started applying this method. What the Assyrian society likes is a method to apply for the daily life. This is very important. Otherwise, forget it. And I'm, I'm going to make you a confession. When I started teaching uh, from the beginning, I was focused to, to, uh, to, to do it in a systematic way. But then I realized that other points were important, symbols. Uh, history. I created a fantasy uh, uh, of history of up in the Assyrian society to my kids in order to have a positive image of what the forebears were. So we should not just tell them, which is good, to, to know praying uh, the Aun uh, Bishmeya, but also you have to tell them how the palace of Kala or Babylon was uh, built and giving them, just transporting them through the images to those places where they, they can also feel proud of it. Because don't forget, we are a minority and you live in a, uh, in a society that doesn't have any knowledge of, of your culture. If you don't give them or provide them with this uh, symbols, at the end, the language becomes a kind of, well, there's no attractive issue on it. And this is very important. The family, in this case, must take it absolutely as a definitive and decided project, transmitting the language according to the 23rd, uh, 20, 21st uh, century uh, methods. We have those methods. We can do it. If just a single family has achieved this, in a community is easier. Just we have to, to make them much more conscious of speaking, talking when they are together among each other, not in English, not in French, nor in German, but in modern Assyrian. If we do that, then it will gradually become a kind of chain. You know, if you are just uh, in, in a group which uses such a, a method, then the people will become much more conscious of the richness of their legacy, the richness of their language, the richness of their culture as a whole. So family is totally important uh, for such a, a first step. Then, uh, you know, uh, in if I make a kind of view upon the teaching of the modern Assyrian language in the educational centers, there we have failed. America has failed, uh, Europe has failed, uh, Australia somehow has, has failed because we haven't been able enough to invest in the higher educational centers to teach our language, to teach our modern history and so on. But it's also normal because we we have experience, we are experiencing a kind of a century history in diaspora. So this needs at least two centuries in order to settle the basis as it deserves. But if we don't, if we don't focus on it, then we will be lost. 
in the Middle East, in Mesopotamia, in Assyria, there was always a society that distinguished you from the others. This was becoming conscious of your own being a, 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 a group which is differentiated from the Muslims. In the Western world, there's no chance. You don't need this process in order to cultivate your own identity, which in, in, the, in the Middle East was mainly religious, but it kept our being a different people from them. And it also it helped our language somehow surviving. But be conscious of a fact. If we don't cultivate our language and invest in it for the next uh, 20, 30 years, then all the efforts that our forebears have been doing, all what our forebears have been suffering in order to, to keep alive this beautiful language, there's no chance to keep it alive. In a globalized world, there's no chance if we don't focus and invest in this way. So all and every Assyrian uh, or convinced Assyrian should take it very seriously and really apply such processes to, if they don't have the chance to invest. Uh, probably the, the University of Salamanca is one of the, um, uh, the universities in the world where the modern Assyrian language is taught uh, as obligatory course a whole year. We, we teach, I'm now going to, to tell you what we do in order to give you an idea how we could work on, on developing um, new methods and so on. And this is not a project of a um, few years. Since 1997, 1998, I have been focusing on such issues since I, I had the chance to teach at the university. So we have today a whole uh, degree where three years of language, ancient, late, and modern Assyrian is taught. And in a natural way, and we are receiving people from outside. There are two years of uh, literary texts. There are two years of literature. I mean, directly linked to the Assyrian legacy. This is what we have to invest in. If we do that, uh, imagine I'm giving just example as uh, I'm, uh, the, the base is in Chicago. If Chicago University is a, is a huge university, but we should have a whole department focused not on the ancient, only on the ancient Assyrian language and so on, but also on the modern one. This is what we have to do. Education centers must be encouraged to do so. Otherwise, there's no chance. Because the, the way we teach uh, in the church or in the family is, is important, but is not uh, sufficient enough. Our uh, teachers today, not all of them, but big part of them, they don't have a whole vision of the Assyrian language from the ancient period until now. Even in the modern one, because many people think that the Assyrian language is a kind just, it has been transmitted orally. Now we are doing PhD uh, works for the first time, totally in Assyria. I have a PhD student from, uh, from Northern Assyria who, is now doing a whole dissertation in Assyrian language, probably is the first time after so many centuries. So this is what we have to work on. Uh, what are we doing now at the University of Salamanca besides the degree that is an official degree where everybody can learn the Assyrian language in different, uh, with, the, with the Hebrew language and so on. We have also afterwards, I saw the necessity of creating a specific branch at the university for the Assyrian language, history, and culture. And this is why we have created the, the Nineveh Academic Chair, which is going to celebrate its second Congress 
uh, from the 11th to 13th of September, where you all are invited to see what kind of scholars are participating in it, what topics we are dealing with, language, history, and culture, literature, and so on. Th this year, we will talk also about the identity issues because we need to have clear what the Assyrian identity is. There are so many denominations, Chaldean, Aramean, Syrian, and so on, but there must be, uh, how would I say, an umbrella name, which is only Assyrian. And the Nineveh Academy Chair is working on such projects. We, we have three main fields, that will be developed mainly by the Assyrian scholars, by the way, and who are experts in language, in history, and literature. We are, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, telling, uh, we, I have been talking with, with Robert a long time ago about the possibilities of um, creating a budget for scholarships for Assyrian talent in order to be trained in their language, history and literature. This is what we have to do. This we have to focus on. And Assyrian language is a beautiful language. Let's work on it. There is a huge uh, work to do, but we should learn an important point to work in a collective way. The, the, the term, the technical term I use for uh, when I talk in Assyrian is Sihtanaid, collectively. And this is what we are trying to do uh, within or through the Nineveh Academy Chair, where the scholars from the United States, from Europe, from Australia, from Accra, and so on, will work together to publish, first of all, an Assyrian history, two volumes, seen and understood by Assyrians themselves. What is a shame for us, and I am part of this being a shame, is that until today, we don't have an Assyrian official history that the Western world should know. We learn from them who we are, what language we have. We, I'm thankful to the, to the Western world. But now it's time also that the Assyrian uh, society, the Assyrian intellectual uh, a group, must provide the Western world with an Assyrian history given by Assyrians. And this will be done by the creation of the Assyrian Academic Council, which will be linked also to the, to the new academic chair.